Hello, hello, hello. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, good day, good night. Whatever time it is where you are, hello. It's good to be with you. Okay, good to be back. Let's look at our scriptures for this evening. It is the 24th of November. Wonderful November. Okay, let's do the 23rd, 24th, and 25th. And the 23rd is Second Thessalonians 3 verse 3. says, But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And the 24th is Jeremiah 33, 3. And it says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and shew thee great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. And the 25th is Psalm 136, verse 1. And it says, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Okay, um, before I get started, let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Thank you for another opportunity. Thank you for this is indeed the day that you have made. We will indeed rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for the opportunity again to speak to your people, to cause some heart to be touched or inspired by your word. I pray, Father, that something will be said to glorify your name, to build your kingdom, to inspire some soul. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, bless you, bless you. As we begin this evening, our topic is so close and yet so far. So close and yet so far. Okay, the month of November is always a celebration for my family. And this November is no different because we celebrate over 30 years of marriage and I celebrate another birthday and yes all the celebrations are going crazy yeah November is a good month for us but last week all of a sudden things got quite somber for me um, I learned of the passing of a popular minister one that I admired and have become quite fond of over the years now, usually, I'm quite excited when saints go home to be with the Lord. I look at what Second Corinthians 5, 8, you know, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Yeah, they made it in. Amen. Hallelujah. That's usually my stance on when saints go home to be with the Lord. But there was such uncertainty around this individual, such speculations surrounding his death, and I was left with a heavy heart. A heavy heart and a prayer that by some chance he made, he had an opportunity to make, you know, his peace with God and everything was well and he went, you know, to be with the Lord. And it really shook me to my core. And it's like, what do you mean? The one who inspired so many? What happened? Died in a state of, you know, weird, strange questions? And either his theolo theology, his theological stance, either his theological stance was, you know, wrong, or the word of God is wrong. So it's like, oh my goodness, what's going on here? So it's the back and forth and the tugging and the hauling and the, you know, this right and that right. So it, it was quite a bit of controversy, quite a bit of controversy around his death. Um, it was very, very sobering for me so sobering to the point that I had to take a good deep look into the Word of God all over again just to make sure that I know that I know that I know what I believe and to make sure that my personal life and my service to the Kingdom of Jehovah God is sanctioned and acceptable by Him acceptable in His sight because sometimes we work really hard in the Kingdom of God and some things Jehovah never called us to do so what's that all about? So it was a time of deep soul searching for me. It caused me to think and rethink what I know about Jehovah God. Think about that. Think you really sure about this? What I know, what I know that his word says? Read that again. Make sure you understand that. I had to make sure that I know that I know that I know 
what I believe and why I believe it. And it was scary for me. I'm like, what? What do you mean? All those years of service? Yeah, it was quite scary. But first, that's first Corinthians, sorry, first Corinthians nine verse twenty seven says, "But I keep under my body, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. When I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway." And I begin to ask myself. How could this happen? How could we, who have heard the gospel preached, and at some point even responded to the gospel message, went to the altar, knelt down, said the sinner's prayer, or whatever prayer, you know, people pray when they are accepting Jesus Christ. How could we do all that? Sit on the church pew every Sunday, Sunday after Sunday. How could we read these Bible passages over and over and over again? How could we preach fiery messages? How could we feel the moving of the Holy Spirit deep on the inside of us? Not once, not twice, probably many, many times over. How? And after all that, we end up with a theological reasoning that is so different from what the Word of God actually says. How does this happen? How? How? And it left, left me to ask one question. Did we really ever know, really know the Word of God? Did we really, really understand the truth of the Word of God? The infallibility of the Word of God? That once God said it, that's it regardless. Do we really believe that? Do we really, really believe that? Do we believe that the Word of God is truth? Do we believe that? Or it's just, just a game, you know? Okay, we'll carry on until something new come along and then we'll move on. Is that the game we're playing? You wonder. Because if people can come along with their strange new doctrines and trick us into letting go of the truth, the truth of the Word of God, the real truth of the Word of God, can they do that? Can people come along and do that to us? Shake our very foundation of what we believe? Are we picking up fables now and allowing ourselves to be bewitched as the Apostle Paul warned the Galatians? In Galatians chapter 3 verse 1, it says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evident, set forth, crucified among you. You saw Jesus crucified. You saw him. You have eyewitness proof of him. How? How are they trying to bewitch us? They are trying to bewitch us. But Paul said, no, don't be foolish. Oh, foolish Galatians, don't be foolish. Obey the truth dismiss the lies and it's amazing how we sometimes allow the noise and the pressure of this world system to sway us from what we have known all our lives to be the truth you let somebody come along with a strange doctrine some wonderful saying and off we go all of a sudden now we are approaching as we approach the return of Jesus Christ as we approach the end of time, the end days, or whatever we call them, and as we, some of us, approach the end of our lives, we now allow some fable to shake us. And we stumble, and we look back, and we turn back. And think of it. It's like a marathon runner. One who's been struggling and striving and pressing to remain in first place. And in the last few meters of the race, to stop, to turn around, to look around, to be distracted. You've been in first place all along. You're almost at the finish line. Why did you stop? Why did you turn around? Why did you look back? What's going on? 
and you ask yourself, what was it all for? Or it was just a total waste. All that struggling and all that striving, what was that all about? What? You went around the track 15 times. In first place all along. You had first place. You're going to come first. And you stop before you cross the tape. Before you cross the finish line. Stop. Turn around. Start looking at this and looking at that. And looking at the next thing. And never bother to cross the finish line. What a waste. What a waste. And I say to you, please don't let these people, like the young children say, don't let them finesse you. I'm like, what? They finessing you. Yeah. Don't let them finesse you. Don't let them swing you. Don't let them play you. The Apostle Paul told us straight up in Galatians 1, 8 to 9, he said, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, un have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. This thing is so serious, so crucial. Paul says, if we, he's talking about the apostles. The ones who walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, hung out with Jesus, even if one of them comes to you with some strange, weird, off-the-wall gospel that does not match the word of God, if it's different from the word of God as it's laid down, said, mark them, label them, label us if you have to, if we come with some strange gospel, but let them be accursed. Let them be accursed. One might say, is a cursed a word? What does accursed mean? What, what, accursed? Well, the Bible refers to someone as being accursed. And it says, it means that he will be damned forever with no hope of redemption. And the word accursed is from the Greek word anathema, which means destruction or misery. Let him be accursed. And this is how serious the situation is. You see, when we stand before Jehovah, we will have no one to blame for our follies and for our failures and foolishness. We will have no one else to blame. Every human being will have to give an account for themselves, for their own life. So if you are foolish enough to let someone trick you, then... That's on you. If you are foolish enough to turn your back on all that you know about Jehovah for some new fable, then that will be on you. I could almost hear Jehovah saying, you know, you saying, um, when he asks, what have you done? What did you do about the blood of Jesus Christ that was shared for your redemption? And you start looking around to look for this one or look for that one. He said, oh, look at them. Look at me. If only you could do that, because the intense light and glory emanating from Jehovah will be, will, it will be so severe and so serious that we will be dumbfounded. Even if we want to say something in our defense, we hardly be able to stand up straight. So you won't be mounting any defense at that time. And the fact that we'll be quite aware that he's able to see completely through us. See straight through the intentions of our heart. Every failure, every selfish motive, why we did what we did, he'll be able to see all of that in that moment, in that moment of time. If we were prideful, arrogant, if we was doing it to be seen, all of it, all of it will lay bare before him. Can you imagine that? Good Lord. 1 Peter 4.18 says, And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? If the godly, the righteous, 
those who have given their lives for the cause of Christ, their entire lives for the cause of Christ, they're going to barely be able to stand up or, you know, be conscious in his presence. When they've done it with pure motives, they're still going to be, you know, just bowing and trembling before him. Yes, because that's what his presence, his presence will be so powerful. Those who are burned at the stake because they refuse to renounce their faith in Jesus Christ, hear them. If they barely be able to make it, barely be able to stand. Those who follow the call of God into the dark countries and regions of, of, of foreign countries just to spread the gospel. Those who beat their flesh into subjection. You know, the temptation hot, but because they love the Lord so much, they did not yield. They continue to resist, continue to walk in integrity. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, they persevered. Those, those who didn't allow themselves to become contaminated by the works of the flesh. Yeah, them, they are the righteous. And if they can barely stand, scarcely stand, scarcely be saved. Good Lord, what happened to the rest of us? We really need to get our act together, seriously. Sadly, many of us will miss the mark. We will miss the mark because we are either minding other people's business, you know, looking at what sister so-and-so doing or brother so-and-so doing, or we are all distracted by the shiny new trends and the latest gospel superstar. Or, yeah, we're distracted, easily distracted. And what happened? We get off track. And before we know it, we are lost. Lost completely. Lost our faith. Lost our faith in Jehovah God. Lost our faith. And we're questioning. Questioning his blessing. Questioning that he had kept us all these many years. Questioning all that. And I, I listen, we don't have time for that. We do not have time for that. The young people say, uh-uh, nobody miss, no, miss me with all that foolishness. Does it say miss me with that? Yeah, miss me with all that foolishness. Because we've come too far to turn back. We've come too far to stop. We fought too hard to stop or back up or slow down. We've got to keep pressing forward. We've got to stay focused. As the old saying go, you can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. Yeah, they don't come too far for that. And First Peter 2 verses 2 to 3 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If you already, what the Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. If you've already tasted the grace and the faithfulness and the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, stay with it, stick with it, press forward. When we know Jesus Christ for ourselves, when we know him by experience, how can we be so foolish as to let anyone bring us some new doctrine? Go back to the word. Because these doctrines have not been tested, they have not been proven. And they cause us to cast away all that we've experienced with the Lord. Just cast it away and pick up something new. No, no. We must allow the word of God to reveal to us who Jehovah truly is. Because some of most of our problem is because we don't understand who Jehovah really is. Who is he really? We must go back to the word of God and let Jehovah reveal himself to us. Because once we know him, once we know who he truly is, there will be no doubt in our minds. No doubt in our hearts about how great and truly wonderful he is. But we have to find out who he is and his characteristic and his ways. We have to go to the word to find that out. Many of us have a very pathetic view of Jehovah. Pathetic. We think of him just like the government. You know, the politician? Yeah, the one that ignores you. So you ignore him? Yeah. 
and we ignore Jehovah. We treat him with disdain and disregard because far as he be concerned, he got just as much power as the politician. So we disregard him. And as they disregard us, and you run all over the nation, run up and down behind them, wishing and hoping that some politician or some government will help us or do something for us. And what they do, they just run us around, run us around, run us around. And when we see them again, it's time to vote again. So they knock on your door and they say, will you vote for me? Mm -hmm. That's how the politician treat us. And we think of God in those same veins. Can't, can't depend on him. Our God is too small. We have a pitiful, pathetic view of God. We think of him as we think of our friends, our priests, our spouse, our bishop. We think of all, we think of Jehovah like all these people. And what are they? They are mortal men. Mortal men. And we're treating Jehovah the way we do because we kind of relate him to them. Can't depend on them, so maybe I can't depend on Jehovah either. But that's because we don't know him. We've not been in the book. These people are prone to fail. They are prone to fail. They are mortals. What they say, the arm of flesh will fail you? Yeah. And we give them the best of our lives. And in return, we get rejection and disappointment. Give them the very best. Your boss. The company. The civil civic organization give them the best that you have to offer and what do you get disappointment but the lord warned us not to do this not to put our faith in mortal man in jeremiah 17 5 it says thus saith the lord curse be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departed from the lord let me read that again. That's Jeremiah 17 verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. You put your trust in man, you're going to be disappointed. We cannot allow ourselves to be bewitched by the wisdom of man. Don't allow yourself to be bewitched. The wise tales and the popular opinions and all these things, stay away from them. Stay away from these bunch of new, new stuff all over. Stay away from them. Stick to the word. Stay in the word. Always, always stick to the word. If Jehovah says it's wrong, it's wrong. If Jehovah says it's right, it's right. And it doesn't matter how much they criticize and mock you for following it. Follow the word. Know the word, study the word, follow the word. Because when the end comes, the truth will prevail. When all is said and done and all the chips, when, when they say, when all the chips are down. Yeah. When everything is over and done with. The truth will prevail. The truth of Jehovah's word will prevail. And Jehovah will always vindicate us. The enemy is always trying to make us feel like we are missing out on some new wonderful thing. Yeah, you're missing out on all the fun. When we resist the pleasures of this world, make us feel like, oh, you're missing out. But just like everything else in this temporary world, all the fascinated stuff that they want you to get involved with, just watch them for a little while. Give them some time. Give them some time. And before you know it, all the glitz and the glamour and the tinsel will wash right off. And when they wash off, which you'll be leaved with, trash. All the glue and the glitz and the shiny and the gold tint. And when all that wash off, you'll be left with trash. Ask the drug addict. He thought it was going to be fantastic when he got his first hit of that drug. Yeah, the high was good. Now what? Hooked on drugs, 
addicted to drugs, can't get off, life in ruins. The glitz and the glamour then wash off and now you're left with what it is. Then came the crash, trapped in the life of drug addiction. And this is what it's like, at the, this is like what it'll be like at the end time. This is what it'll be like. Those who enjoy the pleasures of this world, when they receive their reward, they will be wondering what in the world is going on. What's going on? Why am I here? What am I doing at, at this throne standing before this God? I thought they told me there was no God. I thought they told me there was no heaven and there was no hell. Why am I here? Why am I at this judgment seat? What is this? They said there's no God. They said once I die, that's it, it over with. Now I stand before an angry God. What am I going to do? Yeah. Fell for the foolishness. We allow every man to make their own decision. Don't get caught up in trying to make decisions for people or pressure people into your way of seeing things. If you believe the word of God, keep believing it. Keep pressing forward. Don't be trying to pressure people. If you present the word and they, in fact, um, the apostles were told when they go out, if they're not received, shake the dust off your shoes and move on. Present the word of God. If it's rejected, it's rejected. Jehovah don't force nobody to serve him. Present the word of God. He presents his truth before them. If they reject it, then you believe it. Choose to believe it. Choose not to believe it. It's up to you. No pressure, no stress. Just like Joshua said when he told the children of Israel in Joshua chapter 24 verse 15. It says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me at my house, we will serve the Lord. Everybody everybody gets to make their own decision. It's simple. Choose. Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And if we truly understand that our Heavenly Father Jehovah loves us more than we could ever know, if we come to the truth, come to the place where we trust that love. No trust? Trust that love. You know like how you trust the brakes in your car to help you to stop when you speed around the street? When you come in within an inch of people's car and you slam it on your brake, you trust that brake to hold. Trust. You trust the chair you sit in. You just plop down in it. You don't expect the legs to break it for yourself, for you to wind up sitting on the floor. You don't expect that. You trust the chair. When you lay down at night, you trust your bed to hold you up all night long. Comfortable and sound. You don't expect to wake up, sink down in the middle of the bed on the floor and the next morning. No. You expect that bed to hold you up for a comfortable night's rest. Trust. We must trust Jehovah just like that. Trust his love. If we don't learn to trust his love, we will never, never find his peace. We'll never find his peace because his peace is found in his law. His peace is found in his word. His peace is found in a relationship with him. And his word, the laws that he laid down, those are for our protection. When we follow his word, follow his protection, follow the protection of his word, it gives us laws, it gives us boundaries, protection. And when we follow that, he, set our, he sets our feet on a path where his guidance, his provision, and his protection are guaranteed. We are guaranteed to be protected, provided for, guided by his spirit. It's guaranteed. And we never, ever, ever have to worry about the future. Don't have to worry about the future. It's all in his hands. We don't have to worry about protection. 
We don't have to worry about scrounging around trying to find a morsel of bread to eat. We don't have to worry about that. We don't. We don't have to worry whether our security detail is going to show up for work. We don't have to worry about that. He has all that taken care of. That's when we meditate on his word. When we come into his presence and continue to obey and abide by his laws, yes, all that is taken care of. Jehovah has it all covered, all of it, every bit of it. An amazing thing is that he did not just put this plan in place. His plan to protect you, provide for you, to guide you, that plan didn't just go into place. That plan was in place before your great, 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 great grandfather was even born. And way before that too. That plan was already in place. He already knew that you would be his child and that you would be trusting in him. So that plan was already in place. Ironclad, laid down like granite, already in place. Already in place. And sometimes that's a lot. It's a lot for us to wrap our minds around. You know, wow, that's kind of deep. How, how? That's how great he is. That's the kind of God that we serve. That's the kind of God that Jehovah is. He's that kind of, he's that great. Yes. The book of Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28 to 29 says, Has thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. The everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, that's the God we serve. We have nothing to fear. Our problem is that our image of Jehovah God is way too small. Way, 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 way too small. And that is why we believe that we can understand Him. I can understand Him. He must be pretty small. We can understand Him. We believe that we know why he allows this to happen and why he doesn't allow that to happen. We now know because we understand him. And when we're done doing all this deep understanding, we flip our minds around and claim that we can't, he can't be the great God that he is. Or something that happened that can't be God. No, that can't be God. Then we start pointing at things and saying, oh yes, that's God. Why? Because we understand it. I understand that. And that's a red flag right there. If your little tiny mind, your little tiny brain, that what scientists say we only use 10 or 15% of it, if we only use 10 or 15% of our brain, and we can use that tiny little bit to understand God, understand how He moves, if we could do that, no wonder we get ourselves in deep, deep trouble. No wonder we're in trouble. Because we go off into really dangerous territory, creating a God that our carnal mind can understand. We create the kind of God, that, okay, this is what God is like because I can understand that, yeah. And that's when we start rewriting the Word of God, realigning it, adding our own meaning, twisting and flipping and turning the Word of God upside down, not taking it at face value, not taking it literally. This is what it says, but God couldn't mean that. He didn't mean that. He meant, and we start creating our own thing. But what we don't realize is that when we do this, we are becoming our own God. We are becoming our own God. He's not God anymore. We are now creating a God that we like. We are now calling the shots. We are the final authority. We understand it. 
And instead of judging by the word of God, we now judge by our finite mind. This is the way I see it. This is the way I think about it. So this is the way it must be. That's what we do. And we get ourselves in deep, deep trouble. Romans chapter 1 verse 22 to 23 it says, Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible men and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Start creating our own God. This is what he must look like. Start painting pictures and designing images and yeah, that's what we do with our wonderful brain. Because we're smart now. We understand God. Like the idols of Egypt and other pagan nations, today we put God Jehovah on the level with other gods. Bring him down to the level of other gods. And although they are not made of wood or stone, because we don't bow down to them like that, we start comparing, Je comparing Jehovah with fallible things of this world. Comparing him to our boss when it comes to provision. God can't provide more than this for me because my boss say, that's my salary and that's it. So, we lock Jehovah into a box with our boss. We start comparing him to the police and the security guard for our protection. The Lord placed the security guard there, so that's who's protecting me. We start just comparing him to all this stuff. Comparing him to our GPS for direction. Yeah, we need to compare him to something. Something that our finite mind can understand. The GPS. Yeah. We have to stop this. We must open our Bibles. Open our Bibles. And get a new revelation of who our Heavenly Father really is. Who He truly is. And trust me, if we ever get a real, true glimpse of who He really, really is. Who He really is. No one will be able to swing us or bewitch us or finesse us ever again never ever again because no matter what they bring to us we will be able to see right through it we'll be able to see right through it because we have the description of Jehovah clearly clearly laid out in the Word of God and once we get that in our mind and we understand that understand who he is no matter what they bring no matter how great their claims no matter how grandiose their declarations, we'll be able to say Jehovah is bigger than that. That's it. My God is bigger than that. That's the end of his power. My God is greater than that. My God is mightier than that. Yes. When we read the word of God, it will tell us all of this about Jehovah. It's right there in the book. I tell you. And the way that Jehovah God is described in the Word of God is mind blowing. It's mind boggling. It will spin your head if you really read. Take the time to read and understand what Jehovah says about himself in his word. Oh yeah, you you can get some enlightenment. It is exciting. It is exciting really. To be honest, our problem is that we have not taken the time to read about him. We don't read about him. Although the book of James even declares a blessing for those who just look into the word. The book of James says in James chapter 1 verse 25, it says, But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. Whosoever look into it, open it up, 
Look into it. Look into the perfect law of liberty. The next step, continue therein. Continue therein. Don't just hear it. Say being not a forgetful error. You hear it today and tomorrow you don't forget what it say. No. Look into it and keep looking into it so that you remember it. And then you start doing the work. Oh, James says, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. That's what James says. My friends, we are missing out on so much. We are missing out on a whole lot when we neglect the word of God. We leave ourselves vulnerable to the tricks and the schemes of the enemy because he knows that if we don't understand who Jehovah is or how much he really loves us, he could always slip something in, slip some foolishness off on us. And we'll take it up and be running around with it and speaking it and believing it and declaring it. Yeah, because we don't know who Jehovah is. We need to stop just hanging around the house of God. No commitment, no dedication, just hanging around the house of God. Every once in a while, we go hang out in church. Think I get to church this Sunday. Go hang out in church. We need to stop. Stop casually glancing through the word of God. Take the time to look deep into it, to really read it carefully, slowly, meditate on it. Stop coming just close enough so that you can feel the presence of the Lord. You know, sometimes you go to church and the pastor's preaching or somebody's singing or something and you could feel, they say, give me goosebumps. Yeah. Some only want goosebumps. Give me goosebumps. Make a tear come to my eye and you start crying. I was in church and I was crying. You're just coming so close close enough so you can feel it what we need to do is come close enough to make that commitment come close enough for a commitment come on come close enough for a commitment because jehovah wants us all in his family he wants all of us in his family he don't want us standing outside peeping in Peeping in and thinking and looking at what could be. No, come inside. And let come inside this kingdom. Say yes to Jesus Christ and come into his kingdom. We have to stop allowing the evil of this world to seep in and corrupt our lives. We, 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 we say we accept Jesus Christ. We say we are Christians. We just keep letting the evil seep into our lives. Like cesspit water into a glass of your good glass of water. Can you imagine somebody dropping a drop of cesspit water in your drinking glass? How putrid. And that's what sin is like in the eyes of Jehovah. We let it seep in. Let it seep into our lives and corrupt us. But if we don't take control of this, we have to take control of this. Because if we don't, if we don't make a conscious decision to serve Jehovah in spirit and in truth, when this life comes to an end, when we're all done here and we go over into eternity, we will find that sadly we were so close and yet so far. So close and yet so far. God bless you. Bless you. Let me pray and close. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Thank you for all that you do to make sure, all the things that you've done, to make sure that we have an opportunity to say yes to Jesus Christ. We thank you, Jesus, for coming and shedding your blood and having your body broken and scourged so that we don't have to experience life separated from you, eternity separated from you. Help us, Father, that we connect with you on a deeper level, an even deeper level, so that we would connect with you in a way so that we won't be considered far away from you. We would be close to you, so close to you, ever close to you. 
close to you in your kingdom as your children as your servants as your warriors lord we pray that you draw us because your word declares that no one comes except the father draw so father draw us even in this moment i pray in jesus mighty name amen amen and amen god bless you bless you thank you so much for joining me i pray that something i said really touched your heart and triggered you say triggered yeah caused you to want to be closer and closer to the lord jesus christ i pray that as you continue to seek him you will find him as the word of god says because you would have sought him with your whole heart god bless you bless you thank you once again for joining me and like i always say you could have been doing anything else but you decided to spend these moments with me thank you ever so much and may jehovah continually bless your life goodbye